that will allow. Aloha, everybody. Thank you for joining us as you're coming in. Uh, we're going to wait just a couple of minutes while we have all of the participants join us. I see that it's being populated. Thank you everybody for joining us. We're just waiting about two minutes to get this webinar started so that it will, so that everybody can get into the room. Thank you everybody for joining us. We see a lot of friends in the audience. We see Brian Talisan from Mental Health America, our, our board chair, Cynthia Goto, Dr. Cynthia Goto. We see our great friend, Valerie Chang from the COPD Coalition. Thank you all for joining us. And those of you who joined on time, you're gonna hear a broken record of me saying thank you for joining us. And we're just waiting about another minute and a half to be able to get started. All right, I'd say let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody who is in Hawaii. Uh, good afternoon or, or, or other time zone. Uh, for those of you that are not in Hawaii, thank you so much for joining us to our, uh, to our first Community Connections for Hawaii for COVID-19 post-acute care and long haulers, current and future challenges for survivors. I'm Pedro Haro, Executive Director of the American Lung Association in Hawaii, and I'd like to welcome you to our very first Community Connections uh, presented by Hawaii USA Federal Credit Union. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. We will send a link after the webinar later on this week uh, via email to you so that you can review anything that you might have missed. We will take questions after each of our speakers or the panel, and you can ask your questions by using the Q&A feature on the lower part of your Zoom screen. So please familiarize yourself with that. And thank you very much. Uh, I Once again, I'm Pedro Haro. I'm the Executive Director of the American Lung Association and would like to welcome you all to our Community Connections on COVID-19 post-acute care and long haulers, current and future challenges for survivors. Uh, I'd like to, before we get started, I wanna thank today's sponsors uh, for today's presentation, our presenting sponsor, Hawaii USA Federal Credit Union. Without their support, today's event would not be possible. Mahalo also to our gold level sponsors, Pharma and UHA Health Insurance, both who have been long-term partners of the American Lung Association. And finally, our silver sponsor, Aloha Care. And Aloha Care sponsorship is on behalf of the memory of Dr. Elizabeth Tam, a true pioneer of lung health in Hawaii, and someone who would have been part of today's presentation if she were still with us. We honor and will fondly remember our friend and our strong supporter and a longtime partner, Dr. Elizabeth Tan. And we'd like to thank our volunteer leadership. We'd especially like to thank Dr. Cynthia Goto, the chair of our leadership board, and Vice Chair Valerie Davidson, both who are joining us today. And we'd also like to thank Dr. Ron Sanderson, who helped plan today's proceedings. The four women in our leadership board joined five additional powerhouse women to make our Lung Force Women's Cabinet, chaired by Julie Meyer. The Women's Cabinet goal is to reduce the incidence of lung disease for women in Hawaii. Today's objectives will focus on helping us identify the trends and symptoms and care for COVID-19 survivors, as is currently known based on the latest research. We will also learn about new research being conducted in post-acute care, particularly aimed at Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations. And finally, we will identify lessons learned from Hawaii's response to COVID-19 by healthcare professionals and one of our very own COVID-19 survivors. We will be able to accomplish this through our rock star panel of local and national experts. And to start things off, we will have Dr. Albert Rizzo, the National Chief Medical Officer at the American Lung Association, who will speak about the current trends we are seeing in COVID-19 long haulers. Dr. Rizzo will be followed by Dr. Alika Monakea, Associate Professor at Jabsum, who will speak on post-acute care trends in Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. 
We will take a five minute break and then we will move on to our healthcare panel with Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Josh Green, Dr. Philip Verhoff, and Janela Huna, who will speak to Hawaii's response to COVID-19 from the front lines. And finally, we will end the conversation with Lee Jacob, uh, Lee Jacob uh, also known as Kobe Torda, who will talk about his experience as a COVID-19 survivor. But before we get to that, I wanted to give a very quick background on the American Lung Association. Dr. Edward Livingston Trudeau is considered the father of ALA and he contracted tuberculosis in 1873 and used himself uh, to study the disease, which is the pandemic of its day and the number one killer at the time. In 1904, Dr. Trudeau and other dedicated physicians and concerned volunteers formed the National Association for the Study of and Prevention of Tuberculosis, which evolved into today's American Lung Association. In 1907, Emily Bissell was asked to raise $300 to keep open a uh, tuberculosis sanitarium operating in Delaware by her cousin and ended up raising 10 times that amount using Christmas seals. And today the Christmas seals continue to generate revenue for the American Lung Association. Locally, health pioneer and nurse Mabel Isabel Wilcox helped create the first chapter in Hawaii of the Tuberculosis Association created by Dr. Trudeau. She established it to help Native Hawaiians obtain treatment for tuberculosis on Kauai. Today, the American Lung Association in Hawaii is the oldest nonprofit voluntary health agency in the state. Since then, the Lung Association has transformed to be the trusted champion on lung health. To accomplish our mission of a world free of lung disease, we employ four strategic imperatives to defeat cancer, champion clean air for all, create a tobacco free future, and improve the quality of life for those with lung disease and their families. In the year 2020, we expanded to include ending COVID 19, the largest lung health pandemic of our lifetime. We accomplish our strategic imperatives by employing education and advocacy rooted in research. All right, that was my quick overview of the Lung Association. So a huge part of our grounding of our programs and research falls on the shoulders of our first presenter, our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Albert Rizzo. As Chief Medical Officer of the Lung Association, Dr. Rizzo is the organization's senior medical authority, and he has long been key medical advisor to the American Lung Association. A member of the Lung Cancer Expert Medical Advisory Panel and a leading media spokesperson for the association. Dr. Rizzo is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary, critical care, and sleep medicine, and is a clinical assistant professor of medicine at the Thomas Jefferson University Medical School in Philadelphia, where he obtained his medical degree and completed his residency in internal medicine, later receiving his specialty training in Georgetown University, DC. He is a member of the American Thoracic Society, a fellow of the American College of Chess Physicians, a fellow of the American College Physicians, and a diplomat of the American Board of Sleep Medicine, and a fellow of the American Association of Sleep Medicine, as well as a published author in various peer-reviewed journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine. Please help me welcome Dr. Albert Rizzo. Thank you, Pedro, and uh, for a generous introduction. And thank you for all who are attending today, and especially all the volunteers who work so hard for the American Lung Association. I wanna start out uh, with some overviews, as Pedro said, and <clears throat> we know that the, the novel coronavirus, now we go back to the next, go to the previous slide, Pedro. Um, we know the novel SARS-CoV-2 found in December, 2019 has led to a real growing and continually evolving body of knowledge about the virus and about the disease COVID-19. Um, even today, it leads to thousands of hospitalizations across the country, despite significant efforts to get more of our population vaccinated. We've learned a lot. We are better at handling the acute respiratory illness that led to mechanical ventilation in so many. We've learned how to use antivirals such as remdesivir and other anti-inflammatory drugs like steroids to help prevent the lethal complications in so many. And we're using monoclonal antibodies that help prevent worsening and hospitalization in the mildly affected. So while most people recover from mild to moderate COVID-19 in a few weeks, long COVID is a perplexing set of symptoms that can persist for weeks or months after the active infection has ended. And it doesn't seem to only happen to people who had serious illness. Sometimes long COVID affects people who had mild illness or no symptoms. We'll talk much more about this. Go to the next slide. Some 18 months into the pandemic, 
sparked the emergence of severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, revealing itself to be a protean, comprehensive, and persistent category of patients emerging with what has now been called long COVID-19, long haulers, chronic COVID, post-acute COVID. These patients typically did not need critical care, but on social media platforms and interviews with journalists, there's rolling waves of symptoms that were reported, fatigue, hallucinations, the term brain fog, delirium, memory loss, tachycardia, on and on. And we're gonna talk about all these different manifestations. The slide today shows what I'm gonna to briefly touch on in the next 15, 20 minutes. And that includes the struggles around defining what a long hauler is. This becomes important when devising clinical trials to assess therapies. Also to classify patients for their medical coding purposes, which have very important implications with regard to insurance coverage, impairment issues, and claims for disability. The risk factors are still not well-defined. Clinical manifestations are diverse and treatment is mainly supportive at this time. So the bottom line, as you see in the bottom of this slide, a lot is still unknown. Next slide, please. I'm sure you've seen reports like some of the ones shown on this slide describing patients with ongoing and sometimes debilitating symptoms many months after acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. Peer reviewed literature and public discussion shows that persistent symptoms are being reported among survivors initially those who may have even only had mild illness, as I mentioned before. Next slide. Now, this is how the CDC describes long COVID. Uh, first of all, there's no consensus on definition or even name, but I did highlight post-acute COVID syndrome, which seems to be catching on with much of the research proposals at NIH. Uh, we know, as I said before, it's defined as having recurrent or ongoing symptoms for at least four and sometimes eight to eight or 12 weeks. Um, some of patients uh, have symptoms regardless of the severity of the illness, but approximately 10 to 35% of COVID patients may go on to have this post-acute uh, COVID syndrome. Etiology is still not known, and right now no specific therapy, but we'll touch on a few potential ways to help these individuals. The important thing is that it probably needs and should need a multidisciplinary approach, including pulmonologists, cardiologists, neurologists, endocrinologists, behavioral health. And we'll touch on why some of these uh, clinicians are important. Next slide, please. Now this uh, looks like a busy slide, but the message here is that the chronic or long COVID patient has many of the same similarities of two known conditions, post-viral fatigue syndrome and myalgic encephalitis, or what is sometimes called chronic fatigue syndrome. Long COVID has proved similar to these diseases in that it can be difficult to, to diagnose. All of these conditions carry very similar findings, predominantly among them issues like fatigue, memory issues, arthralgias, and joint pain. Many of these patients often find it difficult to qualify for disability benefits and very accurate timely diagnosis is often lacking. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and organizations represent these people have shown that some of these patients can spend years um, or even decades trying to determine what the cause of their illness is. Many medical schools do not even offer enough training uh, on these types of diseases and research for them is often underfunded. And hopefully that's gonna change with the amount of uh, interest in COVID-19, uh, especially the long haulers. Next slide, please. This graphic shows um, pretty much the protean symptoms that I mentioned already fatigue, dyspnea, cough, arthralgia, chest pain, on and on and on. Uh, and we know that there are complications that occur uh, in cardiovascular disease with myocarditis and myocardial inflammation, ventricular dysrhythmias, other cardiac arrhythmias, hypotension. And as a lung association, we know that respiratory is playing a big role. This is a respiratory pathogen. We're very concerned that there's gonna be now a population of chronic lung disease as a result of individuals who survived their acute COVID infection now go on to having chronic disease because of scarring of the lung or because they fall into this category of long COVID where there may not be any actual abnormalities seen on studies of the lungs, whether it's pulmonary function studies or chest x-rays. We also know that acute kidney injury can turn into long-term injury and there could be a manifestation of neurologic symptoms that I mentioned before that sometimes are labeled under brain fog. And all these individuals often have a high risk of suffering from 
of psychiatric illnesses, mental illness, not only because of what the disease may be causing, but the frustration of dealing with an ongoing disease that hasn't been able to be identified uh, or labeled as a disease and certainly doesn't have the kind of support that's often needed for these type of patients who have ongoing symptoms. We'll touch on why that becomes an important part of uh, therapy for these individuals. Next slide. This just is another way of depicting the very protean manifestations that occur. And again, fatigue, shortness of breath, and this word cloud uh, jump out at you. Next slide. This is just a graphic of the clinic that my health system set up uh, back in May. And many uh, health systems across the country are doing this. I believe one of the early ones started in Mount Sinai back in the summer of uh, 2020, when they were seeing, especially the way New York City was involved with the pandemic, they were seeing a lot of these patients evolving after eight, 12 weeks of having had the illness, still having symptoms. And as you see, based on the identification of the type of individuals in this multidisciplinary clinic, it includes what I mentioned, pulmonologists, cardiologists, neurology, endocrinology, behavior health, physical therapists, occupational therapists. Uh, exercise and rehabilitation is very important in this population, as we'll see. Next slide. So on the CDC website, the post-COVID condition is described uh, as seen here recurrent ongoing health problems four or more weeks, uh, depending on the symptoms, for example, in pulmonary, we often say that 12 weeks is probably when they should be referred to a pulmonologist because it can take four to 12 weeks for an individual to get their respiratory uh, function back to their baseline. But if it's longer than 12 weeks, then other things need to be looked into and further studies are necessary. But we know there's no specific test to either rule in or rule out this post a code post-acute COVID syndrome. Uh, we also know that the goal of management really is to optimize uh, their function and get their quality of life back to where it was before. And this takes a lot of empathizing with the patient, a lot of support for the patient because of the frustration they're going through. And that's why you need to create a comprehensive, individualized care plan that often takes a, a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, as of July, this past July, long COVID was uh, felt to have uh, specific guidance with regard to disability under the uh, ADA Act, uh, ADA for disability. And the trouble with that is that uh, there's guidance for it, but proving that an individual has the long COVID, long hauler syndrome is rarely, rarely where the, uh, uh, the lack of understanding occurs. That's why it takes multiple physicians to support it based on the studies that are available to us. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, 12 weeks or more of symptoms with regard to the respiratory status often then should prompt further evaluation. And this can include pulmonary function studies, oxygen determination studies to make sure they're not developing uh, thromboembolic disease, which has been seen in, uh, in COVID acutely as well as chronically. It also can help us decide if this is a group of individuals who may benefit from more long-term use of anti-inflammatories such as the decadron that is often used in the hospitalized for the hospitalized individuals with acute hypoxemia. We are finding that almost all of these patients require some form of structured exercise or activity or rehabilitation in order to get back some degree of function. The longer they're ill with the fatigue and the longer they are not back to doing what they are supposed to be doing, deconditioning sets in and that just multiplies the symptom of early uh, fatigability and exertional dyspnea. Next slide. And this slide shows the benefits of exercise. We see the post-COVID symptoms on syndrome on the left and the benefits of exercise on the right. And as you can see, everything from the uh, psychological standpoint improves with exercise. Many of the organic symptoms from the neurologic, cardiovascular, and respiratory symptoms are improved as exercise tolerance improves, whether it's reconditioning or at least promoting a, a better frame of mind. All this goes toward helping the patient deal with a syndrome that is going to last them weeks to months. And as I mentioned earlier, in some individuals, this can go on uh, for years. Next slide, please. An important component to the therapy of these individuals is the physician and the physician team who have to have the time to listen to the patient, empathize with the patient and support the fact that something has changed their lifestyle and it could take months or longer to recover. 
And these kinds of illnesses have a rich history of support groups playing a role in fighting the disease, especially at early, early stages of public health crises when patients face stigmas and medicine is still playing catch up. The fact that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is completely novel means that governments, scientists, and medical officials were caught off guard and are still scrambling to understand the complex disease. Today, support groups are attempting to meet the needs of people living with the coronavirus on a more long-term basis. Next slide. As, as I said, support groups play an important role, not only in giving credence to patients who find themselves isolated or not being recognized for having a true ailment related to their still undefined entity. American Lung Association knows that patient stories can be used uh, as part of health promotion and advocacy mission efforts. Patients listen to other patients, and importantly, legislators listen to their constituent stories. There's a strength in numbers and patient stories amplify the message that needs to be heard by researchers, clinicians, and for that matter, the legislative decision makers, as will become apparent as we talk about in the next couple of slides. Next slide. The American Lung Association has online communities in several disease categories on what's called the Inspire platform, inspire.com. Individuals register in these communities and they can choose their level of participation and engagement. We have 11 total uh, communities. The two I mentioned uh, today are living with lung disease, which includes a lot of the individuals with COVID-19. And we have our very newest one, living with long COVID, uh, that acts as a support group for individuals uh, to chat and share stories. Next slide. Now there is some promising news on the research front. NIH launched a new initiative study uh, quote, long COVID back in December of 2020 to identify the causes and ultimately the means of prevention and treatment of these individuals who've been sickened by the COVID-19 but have not recovered after the 12 week time frame. Large number of patients who've been infected experienced the constellation of symptoms that I mentioned before. Uh, and again, fatigue, brain fog are among the most common. In December of that year, NIH held a workshop to summarize what was known and what wasn't known and what were the gaps in knowledge around COVID-19 as acute as well as long-term. And fortunately, in the first series of uh, monies that were devoted to this, um, post-acute syndrome COVID had initial proposal of I believe $1.5 billion to promote research in that area. And some of that initial uh, research is gonna look at questions that are gonna answer about the spectrum of the disease, how, what are the new symptoms, what are the underlying biologic, biologic causes of these symptoms, and what makes some people more vulnerable to this than others. Uh, we know that uh, not everybody is affected the same. We anticipate that there's gonna be a lot of research done in this area, particularly opportunities for clinical trials in these individuals to test strategies for treatment and looking for promotion of uh, recovery from the infection. Next slide. And this is where the Lung Association comes into play. Now this slide shows a lot of our funding for different areas, but particularly in COVID-19 and respiratory disease awardees, we've had 12 funded specifically for COVID research in the last year and five more this, this coming year. Uh, the overall total value of our research toward COVID-19 is 3.435 million in our grants and awards program. Next slide. But in addition to our grants and awards, we also have our clinical our airways clinical research centers that have two COVID related studies that are being funded by the American Lung Association. The first one is uh, LEAP, which is a study of patients with emphysema who contracted COVID-19, looking at uh, how the disease has affected them over the course of time. The other is part of our lung health cohort study, which is looking at 25 to 35 year old millennials basically who really without lung disease, we're gonna be followed for years to come to see how lung disease may evolve. And fortunately or unfortunately, this all started right as COVID-19 hit. So many of the individuals in this uh, age group will have had infected with uh, COVID-19 and will have the opportunity to study how, they, how their um, pulmonary symptoms evolve, evolve over the course of time. Next slide. And then with regard to post-acute um, COVID syndrome, there's two specific studies the Lung Association has co-funded with NHLBI to help move things along. The pedal network is one of them. And the pedal network is uh, looking at acute patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 and then following them over the course of a year 
uh, to see what happens with regard to their lung function, their functional status in general, and a lot of information regarding their behavior uh, and lab work over the course of time. Uh, the additional funding from the Lung Association to this study is helping them follow them longer and do more uh, prolonged studies of the pulmonary function than the original uh, research funding allowed. Next slide. As I said, this allows us to follow the patients longer with the additional funding from the American Lung Association. Next slide. And the other uh, study is what's called the Collaborative Cohort of Cohorts for COVID-19. And this is really a national perspective study of adults at risk for COVID-19. Uh, and it really is a combination of data that's accumulated uh, even pre-COVID from a lot of different cohort studies that have been done looking at behavioral, cognition, biomarkers, social determinants of health, and putting that together with a lot of clinical data such as CAT scans, pulmonary function studies, and other blood work. Next slide. And the funding that came from the Lung Association is helping this collaborative look specifically at the CAT scans that have been done in other cohort studies like spiromics or COPD gene, and also looking at all the CAT scans that are being accumulated from patients who are suffering from COVID-19, trying to put together information from all these scans using what has become the, the buzzword of artificial, artificial intelligence to look into figuring out what is the, what are these scans telling us about who is at risk for developing these respiratory viruses and who's at risk for going on to have more uh, symptoms from COVID-19. Total up all the funding we're putting in toward uh, COVID-19 is about 5.5 million over the course of the last two fiscal years. Next slide. I just wanted to close, kind of sum up what the ALA is doing around COVID-19. And as you may recall, COVID-19 Action Initiative was developed, which is a three-year program. We're investing $25 million in research, education, and advocacy to help move along information about the disease, raise awareness about the importance of uh, vaccination, uh, importance of treating long COVID patients, and really trying to come up with better ways to um, prevent the next pandemic from coming along and being so devastating. And I believe that is my last slide. One more. And uh, much more information can be gotten at our website of lung.org, as Pedro mentioned, and also our helpline of 1-800-LUNG-USA. So I'll turn it back to Pedro for some questions if I didn't go over my time limit. Yeah, no, we have time for a couple of questions, and there's a few that have come in. And just as a reminder, please use the bottom question and answer box on your Zoom screen if you would like to enter a question. If we're not able to get to your question today, we'll be happy to follow up with you um, if you enter your name. Uh, so here's an interesting question. Can young people see long COVID symptoms? What about children? Yeah, children are kind of uh, the wild card here because uh, right now it's still felt that children don't have the severity of the illness, but they still get COVID-19. Uh, they don't often have the comorbidities that may have put them at high risk for advancing to uh, severe COVID. Uh, but as I said on one of my very early slides, this is a group of individuals that also need to be studied and followed. Uh, but one of our messages is just because you think you are uh, not going to get severe COVID, anybody who gets COVID at all is still going to be at risk for developing chronic symptoms. They may be mild initially, but unfortunately, these rolling symptoms can come back and the initial shortness of breath, the initial change in smell, they all may come back along with the brain fog and just the effect on their cognition on a day-to-day -day basis. So you only worry about the fact that a young child who's evolving and developing, what is something like the brain effects that COVID had on adults? What is that playing uh, in the pediatric age group? A lot of unknowns right now. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one that, that's interesting. Are there other lung diseases that produce scarring in the lungs that can give us a clue as to what are the symptoms that we might see in the future for COVID-19 patients that have had this? Yeah, part of the uh, that last study I talked about, the cohort of cohorts, uh, those CAT scans have all been accumulated from people, many of them who already have lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis, COPD, bronchiectasis. Some of those cohorts are also from heart studies that don't have necessarily a lot of lung changes in them. But by putting all those scans together, along with what we see from the COVID-19 patients, uh, we're hoping to see what happens at a very quantitative level uh, in the CAT scan with regard to densities, changes in the airways, developments of areas of emphysema to see if there are some clues. 
the cohort study I mentioned earlier at the Lung Association is doing is really the first and only cohort study of un, you know, normal lungs that's going to be followed over the course of years. And it's going to probably take us 10 to 15 years initially to see what that cohort study tells us about how normal lungs evolve into having disease as we go forward. So hate to keep saying it, but more information to come uh, in all these areas. Well, Dr. Rizzo, we thank you so much for your time. We appreciate the, all the work that you put in, into, into this presentation. It has been really enlightening for me personally to be able to see this organized in such a way, particularly because you know everything is a, is a moving target. So we'll check in with you in, a, you in some time to be able to see what has, what has moved forward. So thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank that. you. Aloha. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our next speaker, Dr. Alika Monakea. Dr. Manakea is an associate professor at the John A. Brunt School of Medicine and has established several locally and nationally funded community-based research studies on health disparities. Dr. Manakea is co-leading the multidisciplinary team to mitigate the adverse impacts of COVID-19 as part of the Pacific Alliance Against COVID-19, or PAC. He received his PhD in biomedical sciences from the University of California, San Francisco, and completed postdoctoral training at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Manakea has been conducting research to understand the mechanisms by which several uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, affects individual susceptibility to acute and long-term care and long-term sequelae of COVID-19, especially in relations to Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islander communities. Please help me welcome Dr. Alika Manakea. Mahalo, Pedro, for that wonderful introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here um, and this kind of invitation to share with uh, you some of our current work on COVID-19. So let me first share my slides. Okay, here we go. Can you all see that? Is it on there? Okay. Yes, Great. thank you. Pedro. So uh, here is where we currently stand in the pandemic globally. There's been more than 250 million cases that have been reported worldwide with more than 5 million deaths associated with COVID-19. In Hawaii, uh, we're, out, we're currently at more than 85,000 cases currently reported in the state with nearly 1,000 deaths associated with the disease. Uh, as you've heard about the impacts of COVID-19 um, already, I want to go on a little bit more detail in understanding how we can, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting something understanding how uh, the disease works um, and how uh, the virus replication works. And I thought after, especially since we're coming down from the current uh, surge in cases attributed mostly to the um, uh, Delta variant, I thought it's important to kind of point out what are the differences between the Delta variant and the original strain and why it's much more infectious. So as you probably know, the COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19 um, hijacks your body's cells machinery to replicate itself through uh, first uh, attaching itself to the ACE2 re receptor protein on the surface of the cells. Now this can lead to cell death and elicits inflammation that can cause uh, tissue and organ damage. And because we're coming down um, from that recent surge uh, in, in cases uh, due to largely to the Delta variant, um, which was the worst that we've ever seen uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, the, I thought it important to share the how, how different um, the variant is compared to the original. So this figure here shows in red uh, the spike protein where arrows um, indicated here are point mutations in the Delta variant compared to the original strain that changes specific amino acids. And this presumably helps the virus bind with a higher affinity to the ACE2 receptor protein in the blue of the target cells, uh, which is thought to make it a lot more transmissible than the original strain. Uh, it also spreads faster and requires a higher herd immunity, um, close to 90% versus 75% with the, original, with the original strain to stop further viral spread. Now, this is because infected individuals have a much higher viral load and are infectious sooner, about two days earlier um, than the original strain. And you've heard this already for Dr. Risi, and I won't go over all the details here, but COVID-19 is not the flu. Um, there has been at least 55 long-term symptoms of COVID-19 identified in patients. Uh, in addition to acute symptoms, which range in severity, as you've heard about earlier, there's so far been about um, uh, these symptoms listed, 55 long-term symptoms described in patients that are defined in ranging from 14 to 110 days post-viral infection. 
80% of patients develop one or more of these long-term symptoms with the most common um, listed here as you've heard from the previous speaker. Now, some individuals are more at risk than others of severe complications of COVID-19, such as pneumonia, respiratory syndrome, and death, as you've heard before. Some risk factors include age, sex, race, ethnicity, and also pre-existing conditions, in particular, obesity. And in fact, obesity, uh, there's a higher risk of respiratory failure after contracting COVID-19, about 2.3 times more than um, individuals that are normal weight. We also see almost a five times higher ICU admission in obese individuals that contract COVID-19 compared to normal weight individuals and a higher risk of death associated with the virus about 1.7 fold higher. Um, our focus has been uh, to understand why obesity underlies this increased risk uh, to severe COVID-19 and also to long-term effects. And this is because we know that uh, certain populations, including Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, experience a higher incidence of obesity and comorbidities, such as diabetes, than any other major ethnic group in Hawaii, which derives from longstanding social inequities in health. We also know that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. In fact, current data, um, especially after coming through that recent surge in the Delta variant um, over the summer, shows that Native Hawaiians actually account for 29% of all COVID-19 cases currently, whereas they only represent 21% of the total population. We also see in Pacific Island uh, populations, Pacific Islander populations, 8% um, associated with COVID-19, whereas they only make up 4% of the population. Now this number changed, um, shifted from last year, um, back in December 2020, where we saw actually a less um, uh, number of Native Hawaiians that were impacted by COVID-19 at 18% back then, whereas there was a much higher number of, of Pacific Islanders impacted by COVID-19 at 27%. Now this shift in um, the rates in COVID-19 infectivity uh, among the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander population uh, is largely attributed to that recent Delta surge that we had over the summer, as well as current gaps that remain in vaccination um, coverage, which I'll get back to a little bit later. Now, there's been some uh, prior reports that, COVID, that obesity and COVID-19 interact, which ultimately comes down to inflammation, yet it's unknown how the gut microbiome, which interacts with the immune system and can regulate inf inflammation, might be involved. So we wanted to understand, does COVID-19 exacerbate these relationships? And if so, how? My lab studies the cell and molecular interactions uh, between the gut microbiome um, and the epigenetic regulation of immune cell function, which under pre-existing conditions such as obesity can underlie differences in clinical outcomes. Uh, we hypothesize that the dysbiosis of the microbiome as a result of age or chronic diseases such as obesity epigenetically alters the immune cell activity uh, in, in, in particular inflammation and can increase susceptibility to severe COVID-19. Uh, in order to test this hypothesis, we recruited a post-COVID-19 cohort in a, in a um, study partly supported by the Hawaii Community Foundation in early 2020. We recruited participants uh, in this study during what we think is the first wave of COVID-19 experienced in Hawaii, which were mostly due to the wild type or alpha strain. We collected clinical, behavioral, and behavioral data from each patient, as well as stool samples and blood samples over a, fo a follow-up period. Uh, blood samples um, were taken every week for six weeks to monitor changes over time in these, in the, in these individuals. All participants were in the post-acute phase of infection that were ranging from either 14 to 100 days after infection, um, but most were, most were enrolled in the study um, within a month after infection. Um, we then wanted to understand the differences in the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 in obesity. And in order to do that, we stratified this cohort by BMI to examine differences in normal weight, um, overweight, and obese individuals, as you can see here. This table shows some of that data. I'm not gonna go through all the details, but you can see in general, higher frequency of COVID-19 symptoms in overweight and obese individuals than um, normal weight individuals. Um, we note that all three groups have equal representation of individuals that entered the study at different times during that post-acute recovery period. Again, the majority um, being within that month after. 
Um, from blood samples of each participant, we were able to measure and normalize the levels of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies that were produced at their first entry into the study and examine the changes over the six week period. And as shown on this slide, um, we found that overweight and especially obese uh, groups, there was significantly reduced proportion of antibodies uh, against the virus over that six week period, as you can see by the graph in orange and red compared to the green. We next asked whether this attenuated antibody response in obesity is functionally relevant. So using an, 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 in vivo, uh, and, sorry, using an in vitro assay to measure the neutralizing capacity of antibodies in the blood of patients uh, depicted here, we found that obese individuals tended to, um, tended, to main, uh, tended to have much lower neutralization capacity over the month of follow-up than he uh, healthy weight and even um, overweight individuals. We also found that primarily in obese individuals, um, there was a significant loss of all three types of antibodies that were produced over that month of follow-up. Uh, we then asked what was behind um, this particular change. We first examined the immune cell composition in the blood samples of all participants over the month of follow-up, and we found that obese individuals had significantly reduced number of B cells, which, as you know, are the cells that generate antibodies over that follow-up period. Um, but they also had increased numbers of monocytes, which are involved in immune response and contributes to inflammation. So this altered composition might explain the attenuated production of, of antibodies that we observed in obese individuals, but what was the impact of this uh, shift uh, on the inflammation and what might be causing this shift in the cell population even during that recovery period? So we then examined multiple biomarkers that are relevant to systemic inflammation. And here's, we're just showing a few examples where we observed that unlike um, normal weight and overweight individuals, obese individuals tended to maintain higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as the one shown on the left panel, um, IF and gamma, and this is after the month of follow-up. Similarly, overweight and obese individuals also maintained really high levels of the monocyte-specific chemokine MCP1 over that month follow-up. And we also observed elevated levels of VEGF, which is a protein that's involved uh, in vascular-related functions, especially in obese individuals over that month follow-up. Uh, it turns out that some of these um, uh, biomarker, some of these molecules are burgeoning biomarkers of severe COVID-19 and indicates that unresolved inflammation during the post-acute recovery may be suppressing antibody neutralization capacity. And this is what uh, this slide is showing here from our cohort. So we asked what might be behind this mechanism. So we knew, uh, as mentioned, and I, as mentioned earlier, um, the gut the microbiome interacts with the immune system in complex ways that we're still learning more about. One feature of the gut microbiome that's important to health in general is the degree of microbial diversity in the gut. Higher diversity is typically associated with healthier conditions, and prior studies have shown that there is a lower microbial diversity in obese individuals compared to normal weight. So we examined the gut microbiome in our COVID-19 cohort from stool samples that they've donated, and we've compared it to the pre-pandemic uh, pre cohort that we were um, recruited from, um, again, before the pandemic, that were equally represented. And here uh, we're showing just one part of that data um, showing the uh, alpha diversity, which is a measure of the diversity of the microbiome in the, in the gut. Uh, and we found that obese individuals that were recovering from COVID-19 infection, uh, recovering from COVID-19 had much lower um, gut microbiome diversity than non-infected obese individuals. Uh, and it was only in this COVID-19 cohort where we observed a significant negative relationship between the microbiome diversity and BMI. So to understand how this might relate to antibody production, instead of classifying our COVID-19 cohort by BMI, we used this alpha diversity score of their microbiome and separated it into two groups, one high and low based on a 50% cutoff. And we observed that the attenuated antibody production over time tracked with the microbial diversity. So low microbial diversity uh, related to this lower or attenuated antibody response over time. And this was driven mostly, but not, primar not entirely by obesity. 
So we also observed further this uh, biosis of the microbiome in obese individuals, which is associated with antibody neutralization capacity. Here's just one example where we examined the abundance of the two most prominent phyla in the gut microbiome um, called Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes, uh, which is linked to obesity. Um, studies have pro previously shown that this FB ratio and the abundance of these two different phylum in the gut are linked to obesity with a high ratio associated with obesity. We found that the higher um, FB ratio significantly corresponded to a lower neutralization capacity. And we suspect that individuals um, that are already uh, in, diabetic and obese individuals that already have dysbiosis is further exacerbated by COVID-19 and that causes a failure um, of a sustained immune response against the virus and clearance. Um, so again, we think that SARS-CoV-2 induces further dysbiosis of the gut microbiome and obesity, and that prolongs inflammation and attenuates the production of neutralizing antibodies in, that, in those individuals. And we finally want to understand what, what's uh, regulating this crosstalk and can we identify a master regulator of this process. So in order to do that, we screened more than 65 plasma inflammatory markers, and that was from a large panel of cytokines and chemokines, and ran it through our engineering uh, pathway analysis program that helped us identify um, top hits um, that might be enriched uh, for specific differences between obese individuals and normal weight. And we found um, the HMGP1 pathway as the top hit uh, in this particular analysis. Um, we found that HMGB1, which is this uh, protein called high mobility group box protein 1, and regulates inf inflammation increases during um, the post-acute recovery of COVID-19, specifically in obese individuals. We think that this antagonizes antibody neutralization capacity, as shown in the slides here, negatively associates with microbial diversity in the gut, and positively associates with this FB ratio, which tracks with obesity. We also found that the levels of BAF, which is a B cell activating factor that regulates um, B cells and its maturation, is attenuated in overweight as well as obese individuals over the course of recovery. The levels of which are actually positively associated with neutralization capacity, which makes sense given its function. And we also know that nitric oxide uh, negatively regulates BAF. And we observed that in our cohort, uh, as indicated here uh, with this data, and HMGB1 strongly correlated with nit nitric oxide levels. Now, this biosis of the gut microbiome can cause, um, it can be sources of nitric oxide. And so taken together, we think that in obesity, individuals uh, recovering from COVID-19 experience further disruption of their gut microbiome composition, which leads to increased nitric oxide levels, which leads to increased HMGP1 levels driven primarily by monocytes, which are expanded in obese individuals recovering from COVID-19. And this leads to increased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and inflammation during that recovery period, which then leads to decreased um, numbers of B cells, low BAF levels, suppression of antibody production against the virus, and lower neutralization capacity. Uh, this all then leads to increased risk of long-term symptoms um, uh, from COVID-19 and also a hard, harder time recovering. So to summarize, um, this is one of the first studies that we've identified and reported an attenuated antibody response in obesity in a cohort in Hawaii. And we think that again, COVID-19 interacts with the immune system as well as um, the microbiota and disrupts already pre-existing um, uh, microbiota compositions that then can contribute to this sort of failed or suppressed immune response against the virus and can cause further um, problems down, um, down the line. We've observed that the mechanisms underlying this obesity-associated severity uh, highly involves the gut microbiome and immune access, and we identified novel biomarkers of risk for severe and long-term COVID-19, which we're still following up. In addition to this, um, we think that some of this data has implications for therapeutic targets, such as pre or probiotics that we're still developing in the lab and trying to understand um, more details how we can use this information um, to foster clinical trials and identify ways where we can prevent the severe um, conditions of long-term uh, COVID-19 and also identify individuals that are at risk um, for, for this uh, long hauler phenotype. I'd like to um, end by acknowledging my lab members, some of which contributed to this project, and also uh, invite you um, to a resource uh, if you're interested in learning more about our studies uh, in Hawaii that address COVID-19 um, through a community academic state research partnerships. Um, please visit us um, on our website 
at www.taac.info for more of that information. And finally, I wanted to um, briefly point out that part of our studies um, with our community um, uh, has revealed some really interesting findings about um, the role of, uh, of trust in modifying uh, vaccine uptake. And we've found in our communities, especially enriched with Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, that vaccine that there's this dual and opposing role of trust as a modifier of vaccine uptake in our community year. And this highlights the urgent need for interventions that nurture trust as well as public health literacy in our communities to really mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 and reduce the spread um, of this disease. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions and mahalo nui for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Manakea. This was incredibly, um... It's been very rewarding to see that there is local research that is being conducted, particularly with our unique populations in Hawaii that are not necessarily found in other places around the United States. So we thank you and your team for uh, taking the opportunity to be able to do these important studies that will add to the, to the literature. I do have a couple of questions that, that came up. Um, the first question that came up is, are, what are the differences that you are seeing between Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders and other populations um, in Hawaii in relations to obesity and the interactions with COVID-19? We know that, that uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have a higher incidence of um, obesity as well as in particular comorbidities associated with it, such as diabetes um, than other populations in Hawaii. And so that puts them at risk for um, for, for severe complications associated with COVID-19 if they contract uh, the virus. And that's one of the um, major concerns that we've had really early on in the study is being aware that there's already pre-existing uh, health disparities um, amongst these populations that are further exacerbated by COVID-19. And so we're putting in place um, not only just understanding the biological uh, um, factors that might be involved in, in severity and identifying those that might be more at risk than others to, to identify, um, to, to better protect them from severe complications through interventions, but also to put in place um, education and community capacity for uh, testing as well as services such as vaccination and messaging to understand how we can um, prevent uh, COVID-19 from spreading further within those vulnerable communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, here is a question that just came in. Ha has your research been published? And if so, where or where will it be published so that we can look for it? Yeah, so I, I'm happy today to share unpublished results that we, for the first time, revealed to the public um, through this venue. But we are um, working on a manuscript that summarizes the findings here that I mentioned, as well as more information, and hopefully get that out before the end of the year. Wonderful. Um, and here is another question. Do you have... I feel that you covered this, but um, seeing if you wanted to add anything else, um, do you have any ideas if Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are being vaccinated at higher or lower rates than the rest of Hawaii and why? And, um, and I think it speaks to your final slide, you know, about, about the, uh, the modifiers. Right. Yeah, going back to those um, vaccine hesitancy. So we do see uh, that certain populations, and in particular in the Hawaiian population here in Hawaii, uh, in my hometown, actually, in Hawaii, and I have a um, higher tendency towards um, vaccine hesitancy, which reduces vaccine uptake in that community. And so we do see some gaps uh, in vaccine coverage in those um, pockets of the community, which um, present vulnerabilities to uh, severe com complications associated with COVID-19 if they contract it. So we're trying to understand um, some of the barriers um, uh, behind vaccine uh, hesitancy. And that's in part what I presented really briefly here that will be actually, that's actually another um, paper that we're working towards and it's in review right now. So hopefully that comes out and we'll be happy to disseminate it um, more broadly. But we do see that there are certain gaps. There are gaps remaining in vaccine coverage in those communities um, that remain vaccine hesitancy. It's not specific to Native Hawaiians, but it's enriched in that population. So we do see that um, vaccine hes hesitancy occurs in other populations as well, but with a higher frequency in our Native Hawaiian um, communities. And we'll be happy to welcome you back to be able to present the results of that. I'd be happy uh, so to do that. Thank you so much to, uh, for your for your time for 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 sharing the unpublished data, Dr. Manakea. We really appreciate uh, all of your time. Uh, if there are any further questions, we'll be happy to forward them to Dr. Manakea so that he can 
uh, be able to answer when it's appropriate. But thank you so much again. We really appreciate it. Mahalo. Mahalo. We are going to move into a short five minute break. And I say short because it will actually be four minutes. Uh, so we will be back at 10, at 10 a.m. This is your, your bio break. Um, perfect, thank you so much. Uh, you have a countdown that will tell you exactly when we'll be back. During this time, you can get up, stretch your legs, be able to do a little bit of uh, desk yoga if you're at your office, but we will be back in a short three minutes and 46 seconds.
Thank you very much, everybody. We are back uh, into moving into our healthcare panel. I'd like to introduce our the former chief of chronic disease at the Department of Health, my former boss at Department of Health uh, when I was at the tobacco program, Mr. Julian Lipscher, who will be moderating today's panel. Good morning. Um, good morning. I am Julian Lipscher, as Pedro announced, your moderator this morning. Uh, for those who may not know me, I've been fortunate to have a diverse career in public health with the Hawaii State Department of Health, working on a neighbor island, uh, working on federal grant programs in health promotion and disease prevention, tobacco prevention and control, chronic disease, and currently as a volunteer, chair with the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Hawaii's Policy Committee and serve on the American Lung Association of Hawaii's Local Leadership Board. So let's get started with our panel. We're proud to welcome three distinguished health professionals to talk about what it's been like to be on the front lines of COVID-19. Uh, first, we have our Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Josh Green. Dr. Green began his career as a family an emergency room physician in rural hospitals and clinics on the Big Island. And after serving in the State House and the Senate, he was elected as Hawaii's 14th Lieutenant Governor in 2018. With the onset of the pandemic in 2020, Dr. Green was named as the state's COVID-19 liaison and has been a leader in helping curb the spread of coronavirus in Hawaii. Also joining us is Dr. Philip Verhoff, Dr. Verhoff is a physician scientist who divides his time between caring for patients in pediatric and adult intensive care units at Kaiser Foundation's Hospital and Kapiolani Medical Center for Women and Children, serving as Associate Program Director for the Kaiser Permanente Hawaii Internal Medicine Residency and conducting research with CIHR. He also has an appointment as a clinical assistant professor of medicine at the University of Hawaii John A. Burns School of Medicine. And finally, we have Janelle Ahuna uh, with Waikiki's, uh, Waikiki Health Center, as a federally qualified health center on Oahu. Janelle helps lead their, their COVID-19 response. And Janelle worked with currently works with some of Hawaii's most vulnerable populations. She joined Waikiki Health, their team in 2008, and provides primary medical care to the agency's growing number of patients. So this morning we have a series of questions and I will start out with Dr. Green. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, this was a disease that mostly impacted the older population. As the older population now, uh, has very high vaccination rates, at least in most communities. Um, how has the face of the pandemic changed in your opinion and what are the repercussions of that? Dr. Green. Yes, hey, thank you for welcoming me. It's good to see you again. Um, so the, the early phase of the pandemic, of course, for the first year in 2020 was quite harrowing because we had no vaccination and so the mortality rate was incredibly high. When we started vaccinating individuals on December 15th of 2020, and then, you know, for the last year, we've been able to decrease mortality significantly. And our senior community was extremely smart. So all of our kupuna got vaccinated that they could possibly get vaccinated. So gradually the cases uh, drifted in age downward for those who got severely ill. And Hawaii is about the most vaccinated state in, this, in the country. We're sitting right now at numbers that really we didn't even anticipate. We're at 83.5% of all of the state has initiated vaccination and 72.2% are fully completed. Plus 89% of all those five and older have at least gotten one shot. So we're really safe. So we've seen a lot fewer overall fatalities than we would have anticipated, but there are a couple of challenges right now that remain. Uh, we're gonna talk I'm sure about long COVID in a moment, but. What we're seeing now is that almost everyone, almost everyone who's been vaccinated is able to avoid severe illness. However, long COVID exists. So that's called PAC or post-acute COVID syndrome. Also, we do still see breakthrough cases and that's because with waning immunity after six months, it's a little easier to catch COVID. So we're really ramping up our, our um, booster program of which 135,000 people have received boosters so far. 
135, 724. So it's a little younger. It's more going to be a chronic disease, though it can catch a few people. I had a 51 year old dear friend of mine who passed away in the first few months of COVID. That was very tough to deal with. So that's where we are right now, Julian. And I think that in, in 2022 and going forward, we're going to be talking more about the 10 to 35% of people who have long COVID with fatigue, respiratory symptoms, and inflammation disease. Mostly it's inflammatory. Great. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Verhoff, in your, both in your research and clinical uh, experience, what do you see as the changing face of this uh, pandemic, and uh, what do you see the repercussions of that are? Yeah, thanks for that question. You know, probably the biggest thing that I, I want to comment on is just to sort of echo what Dr. Green said, you know, the, the fact that we've done such a good job as a state with our vaccination coverage has really made a difference. And this was really illustrated taking care of patients during this most recent Delta surge. They, um, you know, I work in both the intensive care unit and on the hospital wards and of our ICU patients, they were almost exclusively unvaccinated patients. Uh, it was just so rare for us to see anyone get that critically ill who'd had the immunization. And I, I think another important point to emphasize is, you know, we talked a lot early on in the pandemic that, you know, people with comorbid conditions were at greater risk. And I certainly think that was the case but those were also the folks that went out there and got immunizations when they became available. And so many of the patients that we were seeing uh, during this last surge really didn't have a lot of other medical problems, and yet they were still becoming uh, critically ill. And so um, that was really the, the most, one of the most striking differences. The other difference was we saw a lot more kids that contracted it. And, um, you know, we know that kids are a lot less likely to get critically ill but because so many kids got infected here in Hawaii, we were bound to see them ending up in the hospital either with acute COVID or with this complicating disease that's sometimes called MISC or multi-system inflammatory disease in children associated with COVID. And, and that's a disease where a kid may get a mild COVID infection, but then four or five weeks later, uh, develop a number of really uh, important symptoms, including you know, heart problems and fatigue and, and, a, and a number of other inflammatory uh, conditions. We saw quite a bit more of that this time around, I think just because our numbers were so much higher. Um, and so, you know, I am really, really thankful that so many in our state were immunized. I think we, we skated dangerously close to exceeding our capacity as a state for caring for these patients. And, and had we not had the vaccination rates that we did, uh, I think things would have looked an awful lot worse. Great, appreciate your response. And we'll probably get to some of those dangerously qu close questions in the future. But Janelle, you are on the front of the front lines uh, dealing with some of Hawaii's most vulnerable populations. So uh, I think it's gonna be really important to hear your perspective on this. Um, Dr. Green and Dr. Verhoff um, did a good job on, you know, I share the same sentiments um, in regards to, um, we did a really good job with the vaccination um, rates um, and really just have to continue to push um, the ones that aren't vaccinated. That's where, when we were doing testing in our communities, um, it was the unvaccinated ones that were popping up um, during the second part of the pandemic um, and um, really meeting each one individually to, to get them vaccinated. And, and the kids now or the younger ages that it's been approved for um, in the community, that's, that's gonna be our focus. Um, and the boosters, because with waning immunities, there is breakthrough cases we're seeing them um, and sometimes you know they're not coming up until you know yeah they're they're getting screened um, I'm not aware that um, you know that that was happening but um, it's it's also the boosters but like both of um, the gentlemen had um, said before a lot of the people that went to get their first um, series of shots are getting their boosters um, and it's really important because you know we're, we're treating people living with um, chronic mor um, comorbidities and um, a varying um, socioeconomic statuses. Great. Appreciate your response. So in the second question, we've heard about uh, cognitive issues, pulmonary issues, cardi cardiovascular issues. So in regard to post-care for COVID-19 survivors, what do you see as the trends that, that you're observing? And for example, how long is it taking for people uh, to fully recover from their symptoms? And what kinds of populations are seeming to need more care? Dr. Green. 
I think you're on mute, Josh. Thank you. Sorry about that, Julian. Uh, this one's it's personal for me. For you. I, you know, uh, yes, I can tell you that. Um, so I have an uncle who's 68 years old who had um, a bit of underlying disease. He has uh, tragically he's got, had some early dementia, at, and uh, his wife, my aunt Paulette. Uh, contracted COVID and then my Uncle Matt contracted COVID and he had a very difficult course. He survived, uh, but it has really aggressively advanced his cognitive decline. He has Lewy body dementia and uh, which is a tough diagnosis as it is. Uh, but in, a, in addition to that dementia, it's now basically tipped him all the way over to needing full care. So we're seeing that, you know, the, the phase of the disease, you can be lucky. I had just one to two days of symptoms when I had it in September of 2020, or you can have three to four weeks and have a tough course, but that's still the acute uh, phase of the disease. The chronic phase, which begins sometime thereafter, it's a little different for everyone, but say eight to 12 weeks later, if it's still lingering, that's when people start carrying the diagnosis, which will be a common diagnosis of, you know, of, um, of post-acute COVID syndrome that's going to be when we really dig into long-term needs. I think that, my goodness, if 10 or 15 or even 20% of our population has some lingering uh, inflammatory impact from this virus, it's going to cause a lot of disability. And I think the most, the people who are most on the edge are going to be most likely to also go all the way into a care space of need. So there's that, which I, I think we can talk about more and it affects all the systems. It's fatigue is number one. Um, and we've also, we've seen this with a lot of different viruses over the years. It's like well over 50% of the people that have post acute symptoms are saying it's fatigue, but you know, it's, it's a lot of stuff. Some people have nausea, about 20% of people have GI complaints, which is tough. Um, about 40% of people have persistent headaches, which is very difficult to function with. So these are the realities. I want to say that. And then one more thing, which is, this has not been characterized yet, and I may work on this some, probably will defer to, to good thinkers like Janelle and, and Phil and others, but the, um, the society that we have, in my opinion, is, is going to struggle with a post-traumatic stress disorder that is connected to COVID. And we're seeing a lot of extra depression, anxiety, and those challenges, which affect, usually they affect like 25 to 30% of our population, it may very well be that half of our population at least has now been impacted in one way or another through isolation. And I don't think we should understate the impact of that as we try to get back to normal. Thank you. Janelle, you're vigorously shaking your oh, head. Yes. Uh, um, and your thoughts on this. Um, yeah, the one thing that I think it's very, very important to touch on is the mental health aspect um, with the fatigue um, and with all the physical ailments that they have and how it affects their mental health because um, that's equally as debilitating that leads to lost work or no work that leads to uninsured status that leads to you know struggling about finances then it you know trickles down to their family and who else they might be providing care to so um, beyond like the physical symptoms, which um, is definitely what you know we'll see and bring them in, but it's all the other things that are are you dance around that until they maybe feel comfortable to talk about like, oh, I gotta apply for how do I apply for food stamps or how do I do this? Should I apply for disability? When is that appropriate? You know, um, um, or is that appropriate? And um, and then definitely um, offering that support because already there's such an extreme shortage of mental health providers in general. Um, how do we support them that way? Um, and maybe not enough clinics to kind of um, help uh, you know help serve um, these people with um, you know post COVID the long haul of symptoms because we're already trying to deal day to day with all the other primary care. Um, patients that we have to see. Um, so it's at an additional level, uh, layer on top of their diabetes or for our populations, hepatitis C or HIV and already the mental health um, um, conditions that they previously um, struggled with, bipolar, et cetera. So Thank it's, you, that's very insightful. I appreciate it. Dr. Verhoff. Uh, I, the, the, I think the point I wanna make the most is that it's really hard to predict who's going to develop these long haul symptoms. And, and sure, you know, folks that already have other medical problems are probably at greater risk, but we're seeing plenty of people who are otherwise perfectly healthy who are now developing what seem like, uh, you know, symptoms of, of PACS, PECS. And 
that's a real challenge for us. And so I think what the, the other challenge then is for us as providers to actually be looking for it, right? We need to, we have so many people who've been afflicted by this infection. Um, you know, we're actually building at Kaiser a, a program to actually reach out to everybody who's been infected to just screen them for these symptoms because patients may not realize that, you know, the reason that they're not feeling very good is actually related to that prior COVID. And, um, and so I think we need to do everything we can to reach out to them, help them understand what's going on and really try to understand this disease. Dr. Green. May I make one more comment too? I, I, I completely agree. So outreach is gonna be critically important. And it's, from a healthcare standpoint, there are two groups that really need additional outreach. Those who delayed their behavioral health care and a lot of people are self-medicating now during the, during the challenges of, of coming down off of COVID economic and so on. So that's one group. And then a lot of other people miss, this is the family doc in me, a lot of people miss their screening, you know, screening for cancer, screening for, um, well, it's mostly cancers, but just in general, public health mm -hmm. matters, like getting your cholesterol checked, getting those basic screenings, getting dental work done, which is very central to health. All that stuff got put off like 18 months. And it's pretty shocking. I mean, I definitely see people in the ER now who have had one or two small heart attacks and they just didn't come out of their homes. And now they're having persistent chest pain. They finally realize they have to get care. I mean, somebody that probably a year ago should have gotten bypass surgery or, or at least a stent. So there's a lot of that out there. And we'll probably take two or three years to catch up on a lot of that screening too. Right, your message is don't neglect your primary care. Yes. Okay, following up, this is a good segue. As, as we heard this morning, it may be years uh, until we can fully be able to account for the long-term effects of COVID on the population. What do you believe are the issues that we should be looking for and monitoring uh, at the individual and population level? Dr. Uh, Green? Okay, sure, Julian. So one thing is I think we should do a full um, population-wide assessment of people's behavioral health standing just to make sure that their needs are being met. I, I would note that interestingly, Big Island has just embarked on a, um, an outreach program to see what the Big Islanders would like to have available as far as services go. They're doing a statewide, I'm sorry, countywide survey, which is kind of a neat thing. So I think mental health care is, is a place that we should really put a lot of emphasis in the first year of recovery. It always is the poor stepchild of healthcare as it is. And often services are cut or diminished or, or even refused through some of the carriers. You know, they've, they've had to, they've cut back over the years. We saw that actually Kaiser that was one of the discussion points, the, the Kaiser folks, which was, I'm so pleased to see everyone as a family come together and resolve their differences. But that was one of the sticking points was like, do we, we need more services to be available to people because we've got wait times of eight, 12 weeks for mental illness. I mean, that's just too long for most people. We all know that. So that's where I would start. You know, we could talk for hours and hours about this, but that assessment is important. You saw that tragedy, for example, that of that child that um, that essentially was neglected and maybe killed here on Oahu, we don't see as much of that when kids are in school and when we're able to see people and we're able to see each other at the grocery store and see each other at school and see each other at work. We we don't see the bruises on individuals that have suffered um, domestic abuse at home when we're all stuck at home. So these are the big parts of society that have been completely invisible for the last. 20 months and they will become visible again. So we should be ready to help. Much appreciated. Uh, Dr. Verhoff, you've had uh, a firm basis in research. Yeah. What do you see? You know, I think the, it's interesting. I, I, you know, none of us have ever been in a situation where a brand new disease, you know, rises out of nowhere that we've never seen before with all of these health effects. And a lot of people talk about it like we're building the plane while we're flying it. You know, we haven't actually built the landing gear and we don't know the way out of this pandemic. You know, we've got vaccinations and that's been great, but I think we are clearly going to see so many other long-term effects. And, uh, and in my mind, I think maybe the, one of the most important elements to build on Dr. Green's emphasis on mental health is just 
multidisciplinary, right? Really, you know, this is something that requires a coordinated effort among specialists. You need lung doctors, GI doctors, maybe rheumatologists, cardiologists. All of them have a role to play in partnering with behavioral health and with your primary care doctors to, to really take care of these patients. Because I, I think every patient, you know, obviously is different and they're all going to manifest these symptoms a little bit differently. And so in addition to really understanding what this disease is, collecting as much data as we can, we need to be uh, approaching them from as many different perspectives as we can in order to meet all those different needs. Thank you. And Janelle, uh, in a federally qualified health center, a community health center, when people march in, you know, what, what are you seeing and what is your, uh, your institution doing? Yeah, so um, in regards to that question, individually, like um, it was mentioned in the previous question, um, really finding those individuals and looking at their symptoms because everybody is different. And so you're not going to get, you know, one, you know, one cookie cutter um, outcome or thing that you're going to have to um, trend or monitor. But um, so individually, it's going to be an individual approach, like um, was mentioned before, but as a, as a population, um, um, to touch upon like the, the family medicine aspect, um, looking at the other populations that were, you know, not quote unquote missed, but didn't come in because those are the people that, you know, we're running population health campaigns, you know, doing cold calls, um, email blasts to, to do those other preventative services because, um, you know, weary to come in, the numbers are too high, can't do, or we couldn't get them in for their colonoscopies or their mammograms because they were shut down. But now it's, well, maybe I'll just wait to 2022 or I can put it off a little bit longer. And so that's what you're dealing with too, because there's a little bit complacency or just still like, let's just wait it out a little bit longer and, and trying to push them to um, drive those things forward is, um, is what you know some of the other things that we continually have having to focus um and um in terms of that team-based approach that's going to be very key um in a cohesive team whether it's with the primary care person the, the mental health coordinator or mental health provider as well as social services and specialists um, from community health centers perspective it's very hard for us to find specialists that will take our patients take our medicaid population um, so seeing those referrals um, and getting them adequately seen in a, in a good amount of time is not always possible. So, you know, um, education to the providers out here. So what can we be looking for? How can we work up further? How can we work with specialist teams that, you know, we can help um, work up before they see them to, you know, help um, help help the patient get healthcare. Because what we're seeing now is a lot of barriers to getting referrals too. Before you come in for this, because there's, I think there's a shortage of urologists on the island, work them up for this, this, and this, then maybe we'll see them. That's what some of the things we're facing for referrals for our Medicaid patients. Sorry, it went okay. all over the place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, step, I'm gonna step in for just one quick second because I know that Dr. Green has to, has to go to another commitment. So I wanted to give him the opportunity to be able to to bow out respectfully and not have to interrupt anybody. Well, thank you. Thanks for including me, guys. My apologies for having a ridiculous schedule these days, um, but you're right on the mark about what we have to do. And there will be uncertainty. There's no question. But that's why we have extra resources for the COVID response. I think we should plan on using those for public health and direct physical health. That, that is important. It, it should not be lost on us to take that opportunity as we rebuild our healthcare system. So thank you again. Thank you, Josh. Pleasure to see you. Um, you too. So here, continuing on, um, and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to ask uh, Dr. Green the question, but in your opinion, what are the lessons from COVID-19 pandemic that you and your colleagues are broadly in, in the health systems that you'd like to take away? Knowing that you know, sometimes past is prologue. I don't think we've learned a whole lot from what happened in uh, 1918 when a significantly larger portion of the population was affected. But, you know, what have we learned from this and what do we need to take away from it? Dr. Verhoff? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, I, I think you know, you can look at us not being ready for this at pretty much every level, right? Whether you were an individual provider within our hospitals, within our public health departments, policymakers, 
And I think we've learned a tremendous amount. I've been really actually impressed with, you know, watching how, uh, how this has played out and how we've done. You know, we have continued to do well as a state and, you know, watching all of the hospital systems actually come together to the table to talk about what we need to do in order to avoid disaster, I think was really, really impressive. Um, and I think we, we need to continue to build those bridges, right? You know, I think we need to look at our state and our population as, you know, really as one ohana here, right? And not uh, think about us as competing entities, but rather caring for each other. The other thing that, that I was really struck by that I, that I learned during this pandemic that I didn't expect was that, that people have, you know, people have lost a lot of trust in science and medicine. And I actually feel like the pandemic has eroded that. And this for me is, this goes well beyond just doing a better job of funding our health departments and making our hospitals work together is we need to reestablish trust that people have in, um, you know, in, in all of it, in science, in medicine, and uh, the people that are sort of the, the experts in all of this. You know, I have no doubt that people lost lives because they didn't trust in, in all of this and they didn't want to get vaccinated. And, and I, I really think from a sort of public health perspective, we need to understand that more. So I was really happy to see Dr. Monakea's last slide there, you know, sort of alluding a little bit to that. I, I just think that's a, a really critical uh, unmet need that, that we have to focus on moving forward, try and get beyond that because another pandemic is going to happen. Um, but if we have, you know, half of our population not trusting us, uh, it makes it really hard to care for them. Absolutely. Janelle. Yeah, I concur all the way. <laughs> I totally agree. That was a couple of my notes, actually, you know, um, to not um, work in silos, uh, it's just really important as a community um, to uh, work together as well as have you know, continued and improved lines of communication amongst all organizations. Like you said before, we're not competing for this, you know, what a better, I mean, not what a better, but we need to work together and learn how to cooperate. Um, and another thing that, that I did want to point out from another question was the mistrust is amazing, not just with the COVID vaccine, but it's trickled down into other aspects of, you know, should we, you know, what type of test, what type of um, you know, medications, and there's so much that they can, you know, people have access to. Um, so that goes on to communication with uh, patients and their providers um, and answering questions and taking time because, you know, we stopped, but then we hurried and stopped and hurried and stopped. Um, and communication is very important to slow down and, and, you know, reach out and talk to your patient. It's not about just the portal or receiving things electronically. We still need to have that hands-on touch that a lot of people missed or didn't get, even with telehealth appointments, you know, still the idea of talking to your provider, um, that physical touch is super important because you can gain a lot from, um, you know, seeing your patient and, and seeing them in person, not just in telehealth. So telehealth was great, um, but, you know, we, another thing too, we learned about how to you know, use telehealth, but it's not for everybody and it's not for all appointments, but so yeah, not working silos, improved communication, um, and then gaining trust overall in healthcare. It would be a fascinating conversation uh, to continue, uh, although we can't because we're out of time, is you know, how communication between providers and patients uh, has changed and the need for different kinds of communication given the climate that we're in. And seeing Pedro on the screen, I believe our time has concluded. I would like to thank the panel for their insights and their expertise. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, we've learned a tremendous amount. Mahalo. Thank you so much. We do have time for a couple of audience questions, um, which I have in front of me. Um, and this is, an interesting, uh, this is an interesting question. So obviously travel has now opened up. There's people coming in and out of the state. Um, and the question is, what is the recommendation after visiting somebody out of state coming back home? Or uh, if, if you're coming into a home where you know, you're coming into work uh, back after going to travel, what would be the recommendation? Would it be for people to take a test um, after they come back home? Would it be for them to quarantine? Or what would be your recommendations to one of your patients? Uh, I'm sorry, who, uh, we'll yeah. start with, you unmuted yourself, Dr. Verhoff, so go ahead. You know, it's, it, it, that's not an easy one to answer. You know, I, I think there are, 
um, the state has sort of restrictions. Um, and I think it's important to follow what those guidelines are as well. Um, but, but a lot of this is also really an assessment of your risk and the risk of the people that you're interacting with. And, you know, in a perfect world, we would be able to test ourselves frequently before every encounter and it wouldn't cost us right. any money. And you'd know yeah. whether or not you were putting somebody else at risk or whether or not you were at risk. And, and as it is, um, that's, that's not a reality. So from my standpoint, the best thing we can do is make sure that we're all vaccinated because that really reduces our risk of both hospitalization and death by, by such a substantial amount. But you know, we're gonna have to look forward to the day when we don't do all of this stuff, right? We have to get back to what the post-pandemic normal looks like. And um, and I don't, you know, I I don't I don't want to sort of supersede what the state health department's recommendations are, but um, but to me, what we can do to mitigate risk is, is make sure that we get immunized. And, and if you have access to testing, I, I think there's not, not anything wrong with it. I, I think it provides a real uh, blanket, but it's not readily available for everybody and it's, and it's expensive. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I also think um, we touched on it really, just really quickly about communicating with the people that you were coming home to and visiting maybe, um, because they might have feel a certain way. Um, some group might you know, half the half the party that you're going to see might feel like, oh, maybe you should stay home, or the other half might say, you know, I feel comfortable, or we'll stay outdoors, etc. Because it's it's what you know the receiving party also feels their level of comfort seeing you as you return, um, as well as you know the person returning monitoring the symptoms and knowing who you know what their risks were, you know, coming back home, um, who they you know engaged with on the mainland, um, and bringing that home, um, and just having that open discussion. Um, yeah. Thank you. And that's really important for a variety of chronic disease or, or infectious disease that we're, you know, to be able to have the conversation of those people that we're, that we're a part of. And if your work site does not currently have a policy uh, around COVID-19 and travel, feel free to contact us. We have assisted other organizations to help set up their policies around that. So feel free to contact me at the American Lung Association, and we'll be happy to assist you with that. Uh, and at the very least, share our own policy that we've been enacting. Um, here's another question. Um, it, what are your thoughts about natural immunity? Uh, this has been coming up, and this was a question that was actually part of Julian's um, original uh, that we, we weren't able to get to is, you know, battling misinformation on the internet. Are you seeing that in your own, you know, in relation to, to that? Are you seeing people coming in with certain beliefs that they acquired on Facebook or through a YouTube ad, and then they want, you know, action on it because of that, you know, how do, how have you been dealing with that? So your, your thoughts about um, natural immunity and then um, maybe dealing with some of the misinformation that has been happening. Um, how, uh, who, who, I'll, I'll take a stab. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I still recommend vaccination. Um, we don't know enough about natural immunity and what, um, you know, in the timeline of when um, the person got COVID and um, moving forward um, with natural immunity. So vaccination is still key. Um, it's easy to assume or think that we know all of the different social media myths or um, things that are out there. So for each patient, I mean, I'll take the time to, because a lot of patients are very, um, specific about which information they're talking about. So if I know what exactly they're talking about, then, you know, I can do some research or address that specifically. Because if you go into like your, your soapbox of X, Y, and Z, it's not, it's not gonna, it's gonna pass over them because they're stuck on that one doctor that talked or that one person that talked about this one study. And so they're not gonna care about your soapbox. They, you know, you have to almost like refute their study a little bit. Um, and, and that can be helpful, right? You can have an open discussion, engage together and say, well, this study meant this or what have you, or this is what they're, you know, and, and try and really, um, myth bust um, their specific concerns because you know it might be rooted in something deeper that we're not aware of um, and they're bringing this up as the first thing that comes to mind but really it's this that and you know what their friend at work told them and I don't I don't know until you know we know but I say get vaccinated still. <laughs> yeah it's a really hard one to answer and this gets back to this idea that uh, we're building the plane while we fly it, right? You know, it seems like every other week you hear another headline and it's either that natural immunity is better or vaccine immunity is better. And 
the onslaught of, of opinions that are coming at us make it really hard to, and certainly hard if you're a patient, to put it all together. You know, should we be changing some of our policies, um, you know, around allowing people who have demonstrated that they've had infections to, to be able to do things? You know, that's a really hard question to answer and, and not one that I'm equipped to answer. Um, you know, my, my assessment of the literature is that getting immunized after you've had an infection really boosts, boosts your immunity just out the wazoo to the point that, you know, you are really, really well protected. And, and you know, I suspect the same thing happens if you've gotten a breakthrough infection that you've recovered from, you know, that's a little bit less well studied. But the question of natural immunity is a tough one. I, you know, I think that um, it's clear that people are still at risk of getting subsequent infections. Um, and I'm also not sure that I would want to take the chance at getting an infection and risking getting long COVID since we see so many people getting that down the road. Um, and it's also really hard to know how to prove what your immune system did. And this has been a really thorny thing. You know, we don't have a great measure. People talk about antibody measures or T cell measures, but we honestly don't know. And there's no perfect lab test to say, oh, your infection led to a great immune response and now you're good, but this person's infection did not lead to a good immune response and they're still at risk. We simply don't have those tools yet. And so we're, we continue to fly a little bit blindly as far as this goes. And so, you know, we've got a lot of research to really suggest the how critical immunization is. And then you couple that with the fact that it's so darn low risk that um, that, that combination makes us really, really keen to, to recommend that for folks um, above all else. But I feel, the, I feel the problem with that. I totally understand where you're coming from. Well, thank you so much. We definitely have come to the end. We, we appreciate uh, the, the, our three panelists, um, our moderator, Julian Lipscher. We can't thank you enough, not only for being here today, but what you're doing in, in, in your own, you know, actual jobs. This is just on top of, of, of what you have to do. So we truly appreciate you taking this time. We appreciate you preparing for this and answering these questions as thoughtfully as you can. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Uh, and I mean that we can't thank you enough because truly our healthcare providers have been the MVPs of the pandemic um, and, and have been at the forefront of putting not only your, your own lives at risk, but your family's lives at risk uh, at, the start, at the early start. So we can't thank you enough. From the American Lung Association, from our board of directors, from all our volunteers, we sincerely thank you. Real pleasure, honor to be here. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Thank you. thank you. All right, so we are going to move on to our last speaker who is um, a personal friend of mine. Um, I have known Kobe for several years now, and I have to say that when I saw his name on the news, uh, my stupid reaction was, uh, hey, there is a, a guy named Jacob on, on TV that looks a lot like you. Um, are you related to him? Not realizing that this was Kobe, the person that I knew uh, from, from real life. He has an incredibly compelling story of serving as a Waikiki bartender. You might remember him from the news um, as he was one of the first cases of a young person seeing very serious side effects of COVID-19 in Hawaii. Kobe spent 69 days in the hospital being treated for COVID-19 after his symptoms began on March 9th, 2020. He was on a ventilator intubated in the ICU at Kaiser Moana Lua, fighting for his life. It has been a long road to the recovery for Kobe, and he's still battling some of those respiratory problems, but he has a great outlook of life, is a one fantastic person. Please help me welcome Mr. Jacob Lee, Kobe Torta. Hi, Kobe. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, let me see. Let me spotlight myself um, and you. Uh, give me one second to find you. Um, so, um, Kobe, you look great. I, I, I don't think I've seen you since since before, um, but I'm looking to seeing you soon uh, in, in, in life. I want to be able to visit your bar and be able to sit down in front of you and, and, and you know, to have a little bit of normalcy come back to our lives. But tell us uh, about your experiences with COVID-19. How do you, you know, how do you think you got it? What, what was the experience like for you early on? Um, if you don't mind me, I, I 
wrote down some notes because like I, I don't talk too much about it, you know, so if you don't mind me like reading off of my paper. Um, my guess how I got COVID is from work. My symptoms were shortness of breath. I had a 103 fever, body chills, coughing, and like I always felt fatigued. Initially, I went to Queens Punch Bowl for COVID testing. After testing, I was sent home to wait for results and to treat symptoms. After four days and still no test results, um, I was convinced to go to Kaiser ER because my symptoms were worsening and it was difficult to breathe. Upon arriving to ER, I was taken in immediately for treatment. Within minutes, it was best to be, I mean, I was advised to be intubated because of my low oxygen levels. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I am. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is March 2020. There's still not a lot of information out there. It's not like today where everybody knows exactly what it is and how it works. So, you know, what was going through your head? You get this COVID diagnosis. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to the hospital. What, what was going through your head? What were you thinking? Uh, you know, I wasn't really, didn't know what to expect. I mean, everything was new. Everything was just, I, don't know, I, I wasn't feeling well. I didn't, I didn't know what to, what to do or expect. I just left my, my trust and care into the Kaiser team and, you know, they decided what was best for me to do was to be, you know, to be intubated, I guess. So tell me about that. Well, I mean, <clears throat> you have your, your cool nifty scar. Um, T tell us about the procedures. What were the procedures that that, that, that you had to go through? What, what what did they what did they actually do to you? Uh, let's see. I actually like really think about this. Um, upon waking up from my medical induced coma, it was then I learned I had COVID nineteen. Um, on April twenty fourth, they removed my mouth ventilation equipment and transferred me to a throat tracheotomy because of the doctor thought I was stable enough to be taken off the ventilator. Aside from that hurdle, there were other medical concerns as far as blood and gas results, oxygen input and output, rising blood pressure, liver function deficiencies, and recovering from ARDS and pneumonia. Wow. So, you know, I remember watching this on TV. I remember, and I remember crying about this because um, at that point I had had contact with your family. I had, we, you know, we, we had, we had been trying to figure out what is it that the American Lung Association can do to help. Um, Rand Sanderson, our, one of our lung specialists, um, was able to talk to, to uh, a couple of members in your family, I believe. And, um, and so I remember watching on TV as you're getting wheeled out and you have all of the cancer staff, you know, sitting there clapping for you. And even thinking about it, like, makes me a little bit emotional because it was, it was the first time for many of us who knew somebody who was personally affected, but not just that, that you had beaten it. So what was it like for you that day that you're getting released out of the hospital, you're, you're, you're being wheeled out, but what does that feel like to you? Take us back to that. I was excited just to go back home, you know, being in that hospital, not being able to see my family and my husband, you know, face to face. I was just like really excited to go back. Um, I mean, just really, because I was thinking I was, I was labeled the, the COVID-19 virus poster person. There were numerous specialty physician, technicians, therapists, and nursing staff that took excellent care of me and was adamant to see me regain physical from the virus, seeing all of them come out to cheer me up. Discharge really meant a lot to me and to themselves. I commend them for a job well done. That's fantastic. Um, and, 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 you know, that's the other question is, what was it like for your family? You know, your family is stuck at home, you know, receiving some, you know, some, a little bit of, of information here and there. Obviously the medical staff is, is not only busy in providing care for you, but for everybody else that, you know, this is the time when the, the hospital starting to flood in. So I'm assuming that, that there wasn't a lot of information that they could provide. What was it like for your family? Um, they were, they felt, I mean, from what I, what I was told, they, it was like a really dark time for them. You know, I mean, the only time that we had contact was when 
I could FaceTime them. I had, I had to have a nurse hold my cell phone because I was too weak to, to even hold it myself. So, you know, it was a, it was a tough experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so you're out of the hospital at this point. Um, what is care like for you? What are the next few months like for you? Uh, what, what symptoms were you starting to see? You know, what are the stuff that was kind of sticking around? Uh, I had like a lot of, just like breathing. I was always connected to um, my nose cannula. I had a breathing, um, what do you call that? Oxygen tank. Uh, oxygen tank. So I was always connected to that. But, um, you know, I, I stayed in the house majority of the time. I, I think I didn't get out of the house till like maybe uh, the second month of being home. That's when I started going to the gym. I felt a little bit comfortable of being out in public. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, so let me ask you about that. But how has it been like going to the gym? You know, you were you were physically active before you're you're now able to to start working out and you know do all of these things that you used to be like before do you notice differences um well i was really weak i was like i think when i got out of the hospital i was like 160 and it took a while for me to get my muscle strength back and coordination and balance but um you know people are always asking me so oh you're not afraid of being out in public and being uh, close to people on a, a and this was even before the vaccinations. I just felt mm -hmm. like I, I needed to push myself to regain my strength. And then the gym rules was actually really good. You know, they had every, everybody that was at the gym was like six feet apart and you always have to wipe down your equipment. So I felt pretty confident of being out in public. That's great. I have a comment here that says, so glad to hear and see you, Kobe. You are my inspiration to keep <laughs> going no matter what we face in life. Um, and I want to make that comment and I want to amplify that, you know, not just for you, but for your family, that your family very early on spoke to the media, spoke to other people. And I've shared this with you personally, that that if it, that because of them and because they were able to speak up so openly about the struggles that they were going through, I believe that it helped save a lot of lives. Because up until that point, it really wasn't that common to see a younger person be able to see uh, really... Uh, the, the really dangerous parts of COVID-19 symptoms. So by your family being able to go on the media and talking about talking about their experiences and then you doing so after you got out of the hospital and even talking today, I believe you helped a lot of people be able to realize how serious this disease was and how to be able to treat it. So please thank your family for us for, for doing that and for, and for saving a lot of people's lives here in Hawaii. I, I will do. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, um, so, you know, what, what is the concerns that you have for your future? Are you, are you worried about any of the symptoms that you have now? How are you seeing um, some of those things now that you're further out um, from, from being released from the hospital that you're still experiencing? Uh, what are your thoughts? I, you know, I've been taking it one day at a time and um, I just don't want to have that stigma over my head or have people think that, oh, you know, I'm that COVID boy and then they, they can get COVID through me. Well, possibly they could, though, but like, I just don't want, I don't want to feel treated any differently. You know, uh, I went back to work and I had to explain to some of my new coworkers who, you know, obviously I don't like to talk about my situation, but, you know, they did kind of make a joke because of my, my coughing. And then they brought up like a COVID joke and then just like, you know, put them on the side and they told them like my story and then they were kind of, they felt sorry about that. But uh, I'm just, just glad to be back at work. And um, yeah, <laughs> I'm just trying to put things behind me. I just want to continue moving forward. That's wonderful. So what message, uh, or what do you think about the vaccination efforts going on uh, right now? Um, you know, there's a lot of groups that are that are working on vaccinations for Pacific Islanders, for you know, for Native Hawaiians, for our regional population in Hawaii. What do you think about the vaccine and the vaccination efforts? Um, I see a lot of it on TV, the PSAs, the commercials. I see a lot of um, 
people on social media are trying to promote it and I'm, and I'm for it. You know, I think the vaccine is effective. I myself got it once it was available and I got my booster a couple of weeks ago. So I'm, I'm glad that the state is moving forward and we're above 70%. Yeah. Did you experience any symptom, any any side effects from either the vaccine or the booster? Um, not really. Uh, I did kind of. It kind of did give me like PTSD. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I did experience all those symptoms again, but just like in a minor form. So when I did get my 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 first and second vaccination shots on my booster, I did give myself a day to stay home and you know recover. Good, good, good. Um, so, you know, there's still people out there, there's still people on social media, I'm sure you've seen them, who think, you know, COVID-19 is a hoax, this is just a government thing, they want to track us, you know. You experienced some of the, you know, I mean, you and your family experienced the worst, you know, possible things that you could experience and were able to, to, to pass through it. Um, what do you think about those, the, the people who still think that COVID is not real? Um, I just hope that, you know, why not hope that, but I just don't want them to find out the hard way, you know, if they're going to get it or close, close person of theirs might get it. I mean, it's not a hoax. <laughs> just, mm. just trust what, you know, all these doctors and scientists and the meta community community has been like providing us with this information, you know, and plus too, like, I'm, for me, I'm just too lazy to do any of my research. I put my hands and my trust into you guys, you know? So I, I applaud you guys for that. Oh, that's that's wonderful. And there's a message that came in to your mom, actually. It says, to Kobe's mom, you have taught me to have a stronger faith in God and to pray. Mahalo for that lesson. <laughs> I'll pass it <laughs> <on here. laughs> um, And I'm going to say that, that that was one of the hardest things was seeing her... Uh, speak on the news and seeing the pain that she was going through was definitely, I think, sent a lot of people to be able to be more worried about how they took care of themselves and how they took care of their family. So I stand by my earlier comment that I believe your family helped save a lot of lives by, by being able to, to speak up about this. So please thank your entire family for that. Um, and so um, what have you learned from all of this? What are you taking away from this? What are you, you know, how are you, what are you learning in your life? I'm just going to echo what I said earlier, you know, like this, this whole pandemic. I mean, I, I guess like history seems to repeat itself that some virus comes up and then, you know, people don't want to trust what the medical community has to offer. And then they want to be, you know, they want to get advice from their inner circle. I mean, I just think that they should, you know, have put their trust into the people who's been doing the hard work already and then what they're providing. So just mm -hmm. don't believe in the misinformation that's being spread. Um, I have another, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, thank, thank you for sharing his story. This is much more impactful than the rest, <laughs> than the rest of the meeting. Um, I think, you know, I think that we all got uh, different parts of it, but I think that, and this is why we're ending today with you is that, you know, regardless of all of the data, regardless of everything that we're going through, we're talking about real people's lives and you're put a face to the real people that have been battling uh, with COVID-19. So I think that that really punctuates everything else that has been shared. Um, so thank you for that. And then just my final question, um, what do you wanna to say to all those people that are that, that, that help treat you or, or those people that are helping treat other people, you know, who are going through a similar situation that you did? Uh, I am very, I'm extremely grateful for all their help and countless hours that they put trying to revive me. You know, I, I will always feel like in debt to them. So thank you very much. Well, and I want to thank you, Kobe, so much for, for, for taking time. I know that this is not an easy thing to do. Um, and, and I'm glad that you are talking about it, but also how much better you are. My goodness, you, you, you look great. You look really good. I, I, Thank I, you, Pedro. <laughs> so I will see you soon. Um, yes, please come visit me. <laughs> yes, I, I definitely uh, need to visit. So thank you so much. Thank your family, your husband, 
uh, for all of the support that they have given and all of the education that they helped to provide for Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you, Kobe. And so with that, we are coming to our end. Uh, we'd like to once again, thank all of you, the participants who have been uh, part of this. Uh, we will be sending this uh, presentation out um, to you on email. Uh, I, there was a question earlier as to whether the slides would be shared. We're gonna go back and ask the presenters as to whether they feel comfortable sharing their slides. There was information that was presented today that is unpublished. So I don't think we'll be able to share those slides until that information is published, but we'll check up anyway. Um, the other part we have, we also want to thank uh, those of you who are going to be watching the presentation in the future. Our contact information is on the screen if you would like to follow up or have any further questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to every question today, but we tried to get to as many as possible. We also want to remind you that our lung helpline can answer your most pressing questions on lung health, including COVID-19. And you can access our lung helpline by calling 1-800-LUNG-USA. We want to thank all of our panelists um, and we want to end with this message. We want to encourage anybody watching to please get your COVID vaccine as well as your flu vaccine. And if you're eligible for a booster shot, please go ahead and take that. It is the best way to protect yourself and your family and your community against COVID-19. We thank all of our panelists, all of our speakers today, our presenting sponsor, Hawaii USA Federal Credit Union, as well as our gold and silver sponsors, Pharma, UHA, and Aloha Care. I'm Pedro Haro, and until next time, mahalo.